This is interesting. So, but I, in the in the couple of years I spent from when we took Ross at Willow Garage and created a foundation to where it started Zipline, I spent a lot of time with companies that were starting a, a, a robotics company. And I, my advice to them was was very simple. It was they would come to me and say, "Hey, you know, do you want to be a co-founder? We're doing this robotics company." I'd say, "Cool, you know." when you have 10 customers, 10 humans who want what you're building, let's talk about like what we're going to build. And what was interesting is, of course, many people I never heard back from. And, the, and then the few that I did hear back from that went and did that, you know, I would just say of those four, exactly four of them that, that came back to me with customers and we had these deep conversations, two of them ended up building technology that you would never describe as a robot uh, to solve the customer problem. And two, maybe you'd think of as a robot. And I think what's interesting about this is, is um, there's it's if you there, 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 there's a lot of it's very easy to build things that people don't want right? and I think this is and don't really need um, and I think there's there's a lot of you know, I, you know I'm very passionate about this in the robotics community I you know every, every, one of my, I often get triggered when someone's like oh I'm building a collaborative robot and I I always ask them like why <laughs> you know if you look at the machines that, that that we use today right your dishwasher right I love my dishwasher but I've never ever come home and said to myself, I would like to collaborate with my dishwasher. Never. I would never say that, right? I don't think anybody in the history of the world has thought that way. You want these tools to enable you to be productive. You want them to, you know, just like your laptop, one of the most powerful tools we have uh, from, a, from a, well, in a lot of ways, uh, a more and more robotic technology. And generally, it's the technologies that make up robots. You don't think that way. It's not like I want to collaborate with my with my laptop, you know, that's just not how humans think about tools that make them more productive. And I think when you, that one little shift in mindset of saying, Hey, rather than robots being these things from movies that like, you know, sort of you, you collaborate with to saying, Hey, robots are tools for humans. You, it changes everything about how you think about the, the sort of designed and technical trade-offs of what you're going to build and how you're going to build it and how people are going to interface with it. And if you focus on making a tool that people love, uh, then all of a sudden, and it can still be robotic, then all of a sudden it, it, people start to actually want to use it and they see how they can use it and so on. Um, and I think that that, that little switch uh, has made a huge difference in a lot of companies that I've been close to. Uh, and I, you know, as you've probably seen, many robotic startups have come and gone that talk about collaborative robotics and I think they just, when they get to the real world, there's nobody at the, there's no human who's like, cool, I would like to collaborate with your robot. It's like, that's just not how people think about it. It's more, it's like, how can I use your robot to make myself productive, to make my company productive, to make, you know, solve this problem. find myself. Ooh, interesting. Uh, a parent, uh, a roboticist and a product designer, probably in that order. So can you tell me about the story? How did you get the idea after being Wallet Garage and then you decided that you don't want this list, which apparently you've encountered in Zipline? <laughs> I think that was a pretty cool story, but I can just more, how will start your mind the idea of Zipline and this story? Yeah. yeah. You know, I really, I followed some advice from an advisor of mine that I'd always sounded great, but never really followed, which was really just to take your time and get out in the world and understand problems that you might want to solve and see if they're, you know, if you can come up with a way to solve them. And I spent a couple of years doing that, looked at all kinds of interesting problems with all kinds of potential folk co-founders and uh, uh, all manner of things. Some things that you might describe as a robot, some, some things you would not describe as a robot. And uh, uh, it was really the, the, the nudge from family, uh, my family, uh, my wife's an epidemiologist and um, my now co-founders families in public health and they kept nudging us like hey go look at these problems in logistics uh, that just caused these important healthcare campaigns like vaccine campaigns to fail and uh, yeah so went out in the world spent a bunch of time digging around on this uh, to be clear I'm very skeptical right so I was sure we'd go find a million reasons why this would never work uh, but instead what happened is the more time we spent the more we, those reasons of concern got crossed off the list and and we got that conviction that, hey, we could really solve this problem uh, this way. Uh, and the rest is history. So maybe I'll ask you, when you start to sell the team, 
you, you mentioned that already, but I think the building of the uh, the design of the, the I think the hardware you didn't choose to buy then after you explained that. Well, I think that's really too interesting because you you understand how it's challenging to build things like what you have today in platform one and two. But at the beginning, how it's easy or hard to build from scratch the design of the aircraft itself. Yeah, no, great question. The, the We really thought, I was sure we'd be able to go out, find somebody who had a drone that would work for us and we'd go buy their drone and we'd start delivering and that's how we'd start the company. Uh, and it, it was, there were basically two big problems with that. Um, the drones that were available just couldn't do this. They couldn't do the weather. They couldn't do the delivery experience, things like that. And they didn't, it didn't work on the, for the, for the customer or the business, right? Uh, right. At the time, everybody who was doing drone delivery wanted to use these quadcopters and things like this. And it turns out when we really got to know our customers deeply, they really cared about range, uh, incredibly long range. And of course, at low cost. And if you want to do that, you have to use the fixed wing platform because you just can't achieve that kind of range and cost that that's needed for to make this work for the customer and for the business otherwise. And, uh, and then, of course, when we started looking at fixed wing drones, they're incredibly expensive, mostly developed for military purposes. They couldn't fly in the rain. They couldn't do any of the basic things that we needed them to do. Uh, and that's when we were like, oh, no, <laughs> we have to do this ourselves and started designing from from the ground up then. And you can take more of the evolution of the design because I think the end goal that you have something fast, the timing is really fast, and I think it's pretty cool that you have a GPS inside the battery. And I saw that it's really, really cool feature to avoid that this restart yeah. process. So maybe tell me the evolution yeah. when you start from this feature to to reach the expectation in such a critical situation like delivery, uh, medical supplies, or floods, which is critical to meet these goals. Can you tell me the evolution? Yeah. Sure. It's the whole story is one of evolution, right? It wasn't like there were a few steps we had to figure out and all of a sudden we had a great product. Literally the platform one that we scale today around the world, it doesn't share a single component from the, what we started with when we started operating uh, seven years ago now. And um, so some of this evolution was just like, we were just wrong about the product, right? We thought, Hey, if we design a drone that can carry about a pound, about 20 kilometers, you know, we can really have a great product, right? And that was just wrong. We thought it didn't need to fly in the rain if it could just, you know, fly right, you know, before or after a storm. And that was just wrong. And so there are things like that where the, we, the range went from 20 kilometers to 50 to 60 to 80 and now beyond 80 kilometers of range to really make this work for our customers. The payload has gone up and up and up as well. Um, and, uh, and so many interesting challenges have come out of this. One, one of my one of the craziest adventures was just understanding what it takes to fly near the ground, you know, over mountains in stormy conditions. Of course, you know, I'd watched all these, I come from robotics, right? I don't come from aerospace. So I watched these movies with the, with the, um, you know, the helicopters doing the uh, rescue missions and stuff in these storms and things like this. And, and so we went and talked to NASA and they have experts in how to model the, 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 um, the, the weather and the winds at these low altitudes. And so we use their models and they kind of explain to us how to do this. They're like, Hey, if you do, do it this way, you know, you're going to be no, you have no problem. And of course we did it that way. And we had lots of problems <laughs> and we went back to them and said, we have lots of problems. What's going on. And they sort of said, Oh, wait a minute. You know, now that we think about it, nobody actually flies near the ground in storms anymore at, at, at all. <laughs> and it was like, Oh, Okay, medevac doesn't do it anymore. We actually talk to people in, in, in medevac uh, operations, you hel helicopter evacuation operations around the world. And they're like, oh, no, we stopped doing that 20 years ago. It's too dangerous. And that was very eye-opening for us. And so there's been lots of journeys like that where we've had to build our own data sets, build up our own models, and then be able to design aircraft that can really robustly handle, uh, well, in this case, the, the challenging, uh, basically, turbulence and winds that, that happen in stormy weather over, you know, low, when you're flying low over mountains and things. Mm -hmm. What does it take to achieve that? Can you, is it possible to liberate the secret here? Yeah. What does it take to achieve that? So it, it's a, it's a really interesting balance. You, you need a very sophisticated control system, right? There are times when we are flying and relative to the ground, we're flying backwards, right? That's just, that's the winds are that crazy. Uh, you need to be able to climb and descend very quickly. So it turns out the hardest problem is not, the winds coming laterally, it's the vertical winds, right? And so you can kind of picture at the formation of a thunderhead, you have these massive updraft of winds, you know, literally, you know, 60, 70 kilometers per hour, straight up in the middle and straight down on the sides and things. Um, 
And so your plane, when you fly into that, you have to be able to sort of descend very quickly to avoid getting shot up into the air. And then when you're in the downdraft, you need to be able to climb very quickly. And so if you look at our aircraft, uh, it has two propellers, right? Uh, nominally, it just flies on one for efficiency, but in these really extreme wind conditions, it kicks them both on at very high power to be able to climb. And it can even, uh, for climbing fast, and then for descending quickly, it can actually put its propeller in reverse. <laughs> so it can put the brakes on to be able to descend fast enough uh, to not get, um, uh, well, brought, brought way too high into the sky from an updraft. So th that's just a couple of the, of the many details that feed into that. It's, it's a it's been a pretty wild journey to, uh, you know, basically figure out how to manage the energy of an aircraft, uh, as well as sort of the dy dynamics of a storm system, right? Storm systems, what's, what's nice about storm systems is they, you know, they're basically having all these pockets of energy. You can have think of it that way, right? It's not like one giant piece of energy you have to fly through. And so as long as you can manage your aircraft's energy and maintain margin to basically all your flight limits uh, in smart ways as you're getting sort of knocked around in these storms, then you have a really good chance of getting through and getting that delivery through successfully. Maybe if there's a couple features, maybe I will start with redundancy because in the aircraft, you can look right yeah. that you designed to be redundant in every part, bear of that function, we have a redundancy. Yeah, yeah, the, and, and redundancy sort of, Redundancy serves two big purposes, right, from a design perspective. One is, of course, a safety piece, right? You like the other. The other role is what we call operational reliability. It's one thing to say, "Hey, my aircraft has a problem. I'm going to fly home." But if you do that too often, uh, then you, you know you might be delivering an emergency order of blood. And if you fly home and you're like, "Oh, my aircraft is fine," the patient might not be. And you don't and like you want to optimize for that as well. And so when we look at redundancy. It's really anything that can reasonably fail. You know, th there's some things that we don't have redundancy for, like we have one wing, for example, right? But we over-engineer that wing to ensure that wing's not going to fail and it's never failed in flight. And, uh, uh, but for things that like, you know, motors, right? Full redundancy on the motor and the propulsion system. Every control service on the aircraft is redundant. All the sensors on the aircraft are redundant. Uh, and of course, you know, redundancy, this, this is a bit fun journey for me. So I, I uh, spent a chunk of my career in medical robotics where the, you're focused on fail safe, right? So if something goes wrong, you don't want to hurt the patient, but you don't need to keep working. And I thought to myself, oh, you know, it must be just a small step to say, you know, go from fail safe to fail operative. <laughs> and boy, was I wrong. It's a huge step to go from. And how do you design that at the, you know, hardware electrical layers and the embedded software layers and, and more and higher level software layers so that you have very simple ways of detecting and handling all those faults is incredibly uh, tricky design, especially when you have a you know very small aircraft like this. Um, and so, yeah, it was a wild journey of how do you get the airspeed sensors to be practically redundant and the IMUs to be practically redundant and the INSs, the GNSS systems to be redundant. Um, and even and, and then even beyond redundancy, how do you make it work really well for operations? You asked about the, the, the GPS and the battery. This is one of my favorite details. Uh, for a lot of our orders, we have to get the order within the air within, within a minute or two from the time the order comes in for emergencies. And one of the challenges was how long does, a, does the GPS system to take to turn on and get a fix so you can launch that drone, that aircraft. Uh, and by putting one of the, you know, we have two, two of these GNSS systems, right? So one's in the battery and one is in the, in the body of the plane. The, more, the one in the battery is always connected, basically always has a fix. So the second you plunk it into the plane, it's already good to go. And it, it, that shaved a whole minute off of our average time to get a plane in the air. And that's another example of not only redundancy, uh, but just like does kind of that iterative design of saying, okay, what's your biggest problem? What's your biggest problem? And how do you constantly evolve so you have a, a service that, that your customers just love? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Maybe another feature I like about the quiet design and noise, because, because we see in robots like Spot or eight other robots like we see in the in bot security, there's a lot of noise. And I'm just curious about the yeah. quiet design. How did you achieve to do that? Before going to platform two, which is already really cool, but tell me about the sure. concept here. How you achieve that in the actuators? And... Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, the the fundamental challenge with sound on an aircraft is propellers, right? And so, really, it's it's an adventure in minimizing how much of your energy goes out as sound. Uh, and it, and then t it, once you get that as low as possible, then you want to get that sound to be as broad spectrum as possible, right? So not you know, one frequency that sounds like, you know, buzzing insect, you want a, a nice broad spectrum sort of white noise, kind of whooshing, uh, whooshing fan sound versus a, you know, drone sound, if you will. And, uh, and those are all really interesting challenges to kind of make that all come together. 
and this is just incredibly important, right? Like the, for, for this stuff, for, for this kind of technology to be widely adopted and accepted, it just needs to melt into the background. And what I love about our system is it's, it's, it's as quiet as birds for people on the ground. So you, just like you couldn't tell me right now, how many birds are flying over your house? You don't know. Uh, and the same with, same with our, our, our zips, we call our drone zips, same with our zips. You just like, they're just so quiet. They just fly over and you just never notice them. And we just think that's, that's how well robots and, and aircraft like this should be <laughs> melt into the background. Yeah. Maybe can you tell me if something still technically challenging, uh, for you guys? I mean, if you can share something very, very challenging, of course, you mentioned sort of challenging and the weather forecasting and the design to fly low to altitude, but any other challenging that still can be solved? Oh, great question. So, you know, I, I think as there's always, you're always looking for how do you get to the next order of magnitude of, of reliability, for example, um, or the next order, you know, how do you expand how much wind and storms you can fly through? And um, you mentioned weather forecasting. This is something we've been working on for a while. And one of the things we're looking at next here is how do you dynamically route around these, these high energy pockets of weather inside of a storm system? So if you're flying through, it can be like, okay, hey, I just need to like fly a kilometer this way and go around and keep on going. Uh, this is a really interesting challenge because um, you know, the, 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 the for, you know, forecasting a weather system like this is a highly sort of probabilistic thing. Uh, and you're trying to, and you're have, and you have to do this kind of deviation while respecting, of course, all the regulatory rules to fly near the ground and all the safety optimizations we do in our, in our route planning. This has been a really interesting area of, of planning, because if you kind of, if you kind of think about the, th think about the, the, the proxy of autonomous cars, right? In some ways, they have the luxury of having the roads are there, right? So they don't have to think about like what are what you know how do you design the roads? You, have, you just have to plan within the road system. Um, but with with a with a flying system like this, you're you're not you're planning the roads and you're planning how to fly in the roads all at the same time while you have many 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 aircraft in the air, which is a really interesting coupled controls planning and optimization problem that is that is something that we we you know we've made a lot we've come a really long way. Uh, you know today we'll fly out of one distribution center up to about 40 aircraft in the air. Uh, but we want to get up to hundreds of aircraft uh, at, in flying in one small airspace, and which is we have a lot of interesting problems to solve in that we call it the airspace architecture uh, as we look to the future. Interesting. Maybe also the interesting bar, because I saw the launching and how it's uh, landed. I think it's interesting. Um, but can you tell me what I think what's really cool about how you make the aircraft landing automatically by the, the 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 hinge system that you have it. I think that's really really cool, and the cut of blood I think is really nice. But can you tell me about the takeoff and landing, and especially the landing parts? I think is very interesting. How did you get the idea yeah. for that? <laughs> no, that's a great. So the landing was a journey. You know, the, the the core problem is that the life of most aircraft is determined by hard landings, right? So normal landing is no problem, but if you have a hard landing on a runway or any other system. That often determines the life of your aircraft in a very unpredictable way. And so we wanted to eliminate that source of unpredictability to make these aircraft, you know, just, well, be very predict, have very uh, long, predictable lives. Um, and of course, that's easier said than done. If that was easy to do, everybody would have done it by now. And it was a, it was an amazing journey. We tried, we tried many things. We, we tried, uh, uh, one of my favorite prototypes that we tried was basically the equivalent of a, uh, you know, the, a stunt, these, these pads, these giant inflatable pads that stunt people jump onto and land. We basically built a version of that, like a huge pyramid, huge. I mean, it was probably, uh, let's see, how big was that? Maybe 25 meters by 10 meters tall. And we, we came in and we had the planes come in and basically do this thing called a deep stall and belly land onto these things. Uh, we tried many, many things. And, and, and as an example of this prototype, um, we could just, the, the, the G loadings, you can kind of think of it like, a little bit like landing on a belly flop in the water, the G loadings uh, were still, you know, up to 50, 60 G's on impact. And we just knew if we had that kind of shock load going through the aircraft, every time we landed, we were going to have unpredictable life. And so we kept going back to the drawing board, kept going back to the drawing board. And um, yeah. And then the first prototype of what led to what you see here was literally two fishing poles with fishing reels uh, on a fishing pole. If you've ever gone fishing, right, there's this little knob you can turn that sets how much the fish can like, back drive the fit, you know, pull out the fishing line. It sets that force. And so we literally were dialing the fishing reel force <laughs> with this little screw with a fishing reel and we mounted them and we had a big mat made for us by a, by a uh, bouncy castle company. And the, and we had a big deployable tail hook on the plane that would drop down. The plane would fly through, grab a line between two fishing poles 
and, and then bzzz, and then land onto the, <laughs> land onto this mat. Uh, and it really, what was re really exciting about this is we, it was the first time we really saw this really nice predictable uh, loading on the aircraft. And then it was a question of, okay, how do you scale this, right? And the hardest part of scaling is, is again, weather, right? So you're, imagine a sto it's really stormy, you're flying through, just like in an in a aircraft we're used to flying in, when it storms, it bounces around, right? It bounces up and down. And so the question was, how do you reliably sort of land that aircraft, even though it might bounce up and down in a sort of two, even three meter tall window? And how do you do that where not only do you reliably catch it when you catch it, but if you don't catch it, it's not a crash. You'd fly around and go again. And this was, this is, this was what the design you see today is what the culmination of trying to figure out how, the simplest possible way to do that. And I still look at that design. By the way, I love that design. Every time I watch it land, it just makes my, my heart sing a little bit. But I'm always optimistic that somebody will come to me one day and say, hey, there's a simpler way to do this. But it hasn't happened in the last six years we've been operating this system. So, uh, But it works very well. It's very repeatably gentle on the plane. And, uh, and the way it works is quite interesting. So you have, you have these two poles on motors, right? Uh, and those poles are way up high. So they're, they're about six meters up in the air these two poles on motors and between the pole is a line and that line tension is controlled by two other motors that basically control that line tension. Uh, those, the pole tips move up and down and they track the basically about a meter below the plane. Uh, so that line is tracking a meter below the plane as it's approaching. Uh, and then at the very last fraction of a second, uh, we have, what we call the snap algorithm because <laughs> so, uh, it's basically within about a hundred milliseconds. Uh, if everything looks good, those pole tips will snap up. And the to fling the line into the bottom of the plane and basically the, into the, if you look at our plane, the bottom back half of the plane is all smooth. So as long as that line hits the bottom back half of the plane, it will slide in the tail hook and capture that plane. Um, and of course that algorithm, its whole job is basically never catch the wing tip or the nose. Cause if you do that, then, then you wouldn't have a good landing <laughs> and then do your best to catch the tail hook. And, and of course, if you catch the tail hook, it all, it, it lands, uh, it, it, well, it lands, it catches and swings down and it's, it's done. Uh, and of course, if it misses, it goes around and tries again uh, automatically. And that, that's, uh, that's what we've scaled now, well over half a million uh, uh, flights now. Amazing. Maybe follow up question, because you, you said if someone comes with something similar, and that lead me to ask you, how do you think about solving the problem? <laughs> I think that's the interesting part. When you have such a problem and the challenges, the way you think about the solution, yeah. and what's in your mind? How you come up with a solution that's simple and effective and reliable? Yeah. I mean, there's, well, some things are very, very sort of obvious, but I'll say them anyway, right? Like moving parts, bad, right? So the fewer moving parts, the better. Uh, that, that's sort of the first thing. Um, the, the, the more margin, the better, right? To, to, right? So if you think about the plane coming through and you want to make sure that you have a ton of margin to that plane sort of not being where you expect it to be, if you will, um, the more margin, the better. You also want to make sure that the edges of the margin, like, um, let me give you an example, right? If you imagine landing in a net, so some drone, some drones land in nets. Uh, if you're in the middle of the net, you're you, you're captured. But if and if you miss the net altogether, you're fine. You try again. But if you're on the edge of the net, you you know you, you get caught on the corner of the net and, and you crash, right? And so that's an example where you have to have a huge net to have the margin you want to make sure that landing's reliable. Um, you know, beyond that, then it's a matter of just looking at every possible failure mode and believing that you have a really robust sort of way of eliminating that failure mode. And so if you, you know, some things are simple, right? If you, uh, one good example in the, in the world of robotic design, again, not something, nothing, I'm not, nothing groundbreaking here. Uh, linear motion, much harder to make reliable than rotary motion. So if you look at our recovery system, it's you know, very simple rotary motion, very easy to seal those motors, make them, uh, you know, salt uh, fog proof and things like that to last many, many years outside, where with linear motion, much, much harder, requires much more frequent maintenance and things like that. So it's basically kind of a journey of, you know, again, always that search for simplicity, but I, you want to always focus on finding the simplest solution to the hardest part of the problem. In this case, the margin question was like the hardest thing. How do you get that margin? So you just kind of, no matter how bad the flight might be coming through, you're still going to be okay. And then, okay, how do I simplify, how do I find the simplest solutions to the next hardest problem, the next hardest problem, next hardest problem. And you basically kind of go down that journey over and over again. You know, I, we literally explored in, in depth, maybe 20 different landing concepts before deciding to do the one we, we went with. Uh, and when I say explored, I'd say half of those we prototyped all the way to flight to, to really understand them well. Uh, and you kind of get to a dead end where you're like, hey, this, this part of the, you know, 
hardest problem was solved. Next hardest problem was solved. But this problem, we just don't, we don't see an elegant solution there. We want to go back and explore another path, explore another path. And eventually, if you give yourself the space, you can, well, end up something that works, hopefully. And why did you start a bit like a platform too? Is it the reason about the bayload or something? Yeah. What is the motivation to, to do that? Because it's also really cool. Yeah. You know, so platform one, so the way platform one delivers, right? It's a, it's a, it's a fixed wing aircraft, right? It looks like a large RC plane and uh, for it to deliver, it flies over your delivery site, like a, the, the yard of a clinic or a patient's home. And it, it, it releases the package. The package looks like a cake box sort of size um, with a paper parachute on it. And that, and that floats down into the, into the delivery site. And that requires a fair bit of space, as you can imagine, right? And that works great when you're operating from a metro area and serving the surrounding smaller cities and towns sort of outside of a metro area, because you generally have that space to float a package into someone's yard. Um, but our customers had been asking for years for us, okay, can you do, can you deliver in metro areas? And can you deliver to more patient homes? And of course, for many years, we just said, no, we cannot. <laughs> our system is really good for this other thing. Uh, uh, and, and a few years ago, um, we basically said, okay, enough, pay, enough of our customers are asking for this. Can we do it? Right. And we looked around and, you know, in the drone delivery world and the other automated delivery solutions, there was just nothing we liked, right? Things were not very precise or very noisy uh, or had other big limitations like speed of delivery if they're on the ground for sidewalk robots and things like this. And there was just nothing we were excited about. So we basically asked ourselves a, a simple question, which was like, hey, could we come up with a delivery solution that actually got the precision with the delivery experience that we actually liked, right? That was quiet enough and precise enough to, and, and all of these other things we care about, like the sort of environmental footprint of the delivery and the speed of the delivery and all these other things. Could we actually do that? And we spent, we spent a couple of years exploring that uh, and eventually came to the architecture that, that we've now announced for Platform 2, which, which is, gets phenomenally great precision. It's incredibly quiet and unobtrusive. Has, and it also achieves these other things that are just so important for acceptance, right? It's very sort of cute and approachable and, um, uh, and, and, has, and, and it makes a lot of, again, the very hard problems like safety very, uh, very straightforward and, and, and easy in the architecture. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the platform tool because I think you, I, it's really impressive about that being quiet and it, it sounds to me, there's nothing in the market or something like that. And I, I also the design itself, the way you design the vehicle itself. Yeah. It's, I'm curious yeah. about Go ahead. How, how you start to think about the design just because it's, it's not traditional. I feel like there's something here. It's really impressive. I, I didn't see something like that. It's definitely not traditional. <laughs> It was so, so the, just like with platform one, we started working very closely with customers, uh, a few select customers in, internal to the design process to make sure, to make sure we had the data that we needed to, 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 to basically mo to design a system that would really work for our customers. Right. When you're designing a system like this, the first thing that's, you know, the physics is unrelenting, right? You don't get anything for free. Everything is a hard trade. If you want to lower the cost, you know, that's going to come at, you know, that's going to come at the penalty of may, how much payload you can carry or how much range you can fly. If you want to fly farther, you know, that's going to either cost more or reduce your payload. All these things are very tightly coupled in the design space. And, and, and that's just at the, at the, at the aircraft and, 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 uh, and delivery system level. You also have to take into account what are the costs of actually operating the system uh, from an install perspective, from a maintenance perspective, from you know, who's loading and how the loading works for, the, for deliveries. That all has to be really coupled into the design. And without deep involvement from real customers who you can deeply understand their, their world, I, I think it's essentially impossible to design something like this. So instead of another way, by, by working closely with those customers, it helped motivate us to solve problems that we wouldn't have been motivated to solve otherwise that make this platform great. Um, and so one of those is just how the precision, because one of the questions was, okay, our customers want precise. They want this, you know, especially on the, on the health system side of our business, they want this to work for all of their patients. They don't want it to work just for, you know, 50% that have enough space or something like that. Uh, and so we, we, we went out and we did uh, large scale GIS analysis, you know, analyzing, you know, property by property by property in many places in the world to really understand how much open space is there when you take into account the trees and the buildings and everything. And this came, this is how we came up with this requirement, which is very tight, which is basically a, you need about a, you need about a meter of open space for platform two. 
Um, and, and we were looking at that. We're like, okay, how on earth do you do that reliably, right? Not just in fair weather. How do you do that in all weather? And that, that was one of the hardest problems that motivated the work on Platform 2. And so we spent a lot of time just looking at that problem. And again, philosophically, the way we design is take the hardest problem and find the simplest possible solution to that. And then you find solutions to all the, the next hardest problems. Uh, and we explored many, many, many concepts for this. Um, and you know, in some ways, the design of Platform 2 in hindsight, of course, always looks more obvious than when you start. But if you want to deliver to a very tight space, you need the vehicle doing the delivery to be as small as possible, right? If, if you want to deliver to a meter of open space and your vehicle is a meter across, good luck. <laughs> it's not going to fit. <laughs> it needs to be smaller. And so one of the questions was, okay, if we want to deliver a relatively large package, how do we make a delivery vehicle that's barely bigger than the package? Because that optimizes for how many homes we can deliver to. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time thinking about that problem and kind of working backwards from it. And if you if you make that as small as possible, it it can solve it, it can be capable of you know fighting winds and things like that. But you can't make it capable of carrying the weight of the package. And that's where you know if you platform two has this little droid that comes down to the de ground for delivery, and it has a string going up from that up to our zip. We call it our zip, our drone up high, that actually is capable of carrying the weight. And that was a nice way of saying, okay, I can now get into tight spaces uh, and I can deliver something useful in terms of the weight we can deliver uh, by having this line that goes up to the, 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 the aircraft up high that does the literal heavy lifting <laughs> of the delivery. And this is sort of an example of kind of that working backwards from what, what really matters to the customer, how do you do it? Uh, and then, yeah, and that's how we ended up with this two-part architecture, the droid that comes down and the, and the zip that stays uh, way up high. Um, and I should mention, you know, so, so the, the zip zip stays as, as high up as a, as a hundred meters. So it's way up there. You barely notice it. And we, when we were just doing some prototyping with this, one of the things that we just noticed when we were, we were experimenting is just how nice it is to, to have when, when that, when that aircraft is up about hundred meters, it just doesn't feel like it's in your space at all. Uh, and we love that. And we're like, okay, how do we preserve that in the architecture? Um, and it turns out, well, it turns out that a lot of people think having a long line is actually a hard part of this design. And it's really not, we can talk a bit about the controls there, but it's really, it, it turns out it's actually quite easy to have a long line. If you, you know, if you keep certain things simple and of course that of course makes it unobtrusive, it makes the safety challenges much more straightforward, right? Uh, to have that aircraft that's actually large stay that high up. Um, it's, and of course it helps so much with making it quiet, which is, we all, we, we learned from platform one, you know. Quiet drones are good drones, <laughs> and that's hard to achieve. But I'm guessing, can I talk about the control? Because I think people appreciate this into that. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about that, the controls here? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So in some ways, it's very, very simple, right? During the delivery, you can essentially think, so the droid has its own smarts on board, right? So the droid is its own sensor. So it's looking for that flat spot to deliver and avoiding the trees as it comes down. So this, that makes that control system, you kind of think of that control system locally as lateral, right? Left, right, turning. Um, and then it has a very simple link up to the zip. So there's a winch up on the zip. Uh, it's a, a very simple, you know, direct drive motor up there that, that controls the line. And so the, the droid is basically flying itself laterally and, and then we're sending requests up to the zip of say, of, you know, basically, you know, descend slower, descend slower, descend slower. Okay, I delivered, retract me. <laughs> and so it really it's, it's, it's a lot of people think it's a very coupled controls problem and it's not. The zip is just sort of hanging out there. And there's, there's some things we do, but, but they're very decoupled, right? The zip has a job to do. Uh, which is essentially just hang out in one spot and then listen to the the request from the droid uh, to control its winch. Um, and beyond that, um, it works quite well. As long as you maintain things like minimum line tension and stuff like that, it's all very predictable and straightforward. And the droid, which is the thing that actually comes close to obstacles, um, right? Like the trees you want to avoid and the umbrellas and you name it, what's in people's backyards. Uh, it, 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 it's the one to be able to send, make these very simple calculations of like, all right, I found a tube to fly through and deliver. I delivered and, and retract me, please. Um, if that makes sense. Amazing. Maybe I'm curious about how that, now you, you, you operate in Rwanda and Tanzania. And I think, um, maybe I'm curious, you, you already mentioned that in the other podcasts about that, the country yeah. location and regulation and all things. So I don't want to repeat that, but yeah. maybe I'm curious about in the delivery, like uh, food delivery, uh, what, something we do every day, how would this would shape, change it, everything? Do you think there's competition or competitors or will people like, I'm just curious about how would this shape the, the space with the delivery, not only 
in in medical supplies, but food, whatever. How, how do you yeah. see the competition here and the market? What looks like? Absolutely. You know, I, I the the there's a few things that add up to this delivery experience being so exciting, and I believe the best delivery experience compared to any other option. And so, obviously, most deliveries on demand are done by you know person driving a vehicle, right? And uh, there, there, there's there's some really obvious wins that we have, like we can fly very fast. You know, we can fly 70 miles an hour straight there, traffic no problem. Uh, you know, those kind of things, very predictable, very very quick. And so. Uh, you know, if you're ordering food, it's actually on time. It's still hot. These kinds of things that we all value. Um, the, 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 there's things like that that are just so exciting about what this really looks like. Um, and being able to really leapfrog all the sort of status quo of delivery is really exciting on things like speed, but also things like environmental impact. Um, you know, this is the, the, the environmental footprint of this, these systems is so phenomenally better than even an electric car doing a delivery. Um, it, it really, it really radically changes that dynamic. And there's very few things in the world to, just for comparison, by the way. So if you, if you take, uh, if you deliver with our, with a, with our system versus, you know, person in a, in a car, in a regular car, you know, it's, we use about one thirty fourth of the, uh, the environmental impact in terms of CO2, go looking all the way back to our manufacturing impact. And th there's very few things you can do in the world when you display something that have that big of a win. And what I love about that is it really changes the dynamic, right? A lot of people are thinking, okay, should I get dinner delivered or, you know, should I not have the environmental impact of having my dinner delivered? And this basically means you don't have to choose. You can have, you can have the minimum environmental impact and get that food delivered. And I, you know, food is a great example of the value of on-demand delivery because everybody wants their meal to be hot. And if you're like me with kids, you ordered food, you really want that food to be on time because half hour late is, you know, a big deal. The whole evening is like kids are overtired and so on. Uh, but there's so many other things. This is one of the things that, that I don't think I appreciated when we started Zipline is that it's the power of making things available on demand and quickly uh, across the board, healthcare, food, but even just any kind of supply it radically improves uh, basically the efficiency of our economic system, right? It enables anybody doing anything to just be that much more efficient, that much more responsive, that much more um, capable economically of, for what they're doing. And that's really transformative. And I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that very macroeconomic impact we, that we bring to communities that we serve uh, by just enabling everybody we serve to just like have the world at their fingertips. And I, I, you know, obviously, you know, if, a metaphor for if you in the world of software, right? If you're writing software and you can compile faster, right? You just, you're just a more productive software engineer. And in the world of everything else that involves hardware, right? From food to, you know, engineering prototyping to, uh, you know, serving patients in a, in a hospital. If you just have what you need at your fingertips, you're just that much more productive. And that's really, uh, I'm really excited about that. Absolutely. Since you could a few questions for you, maybe the first one about energy. And uh, I, I saw that you already used the, the lithium battery, I think, if correct me. But can you tell me about the energy? Do you yeah. have any wishes about the material or the energy? Because I know it's low cost and I think it's maintained easily. But do you have any wishes for the material or energy here? Yeah, I mean, there's there's the... We we sort of we, we ride the battery evolution coming out of the electric car industry, which is which is a really um, uh, which works very well for us. And there's no question we're we're working with battery companies now who are working on what's going to come out in a few years, and we're even more excited about those batteries. And of course, we keep upgrading what we our battery packs as we go, and the, that just enables us to carry more payload and fly farther and have more margin for for storms and things. Um, and it's, 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 uh, yeah, there's, it's the, the electric vehicle industry has created a market for just phenomenally good and reliable batteries, uh, that really enables technology like this to happen. And that's, uh, yeah, there's, there's, it's very exciting. So I think I want to ask you, what keeps you excited? I see the whole thing that you're very passionate, excited, and I live like that. Can you just, how do you feel about the next thing? Like when you think I feel a little passion while you talk. It's very contagious. So, <laughs> um, I it, there's there's you know in some ways I feel very lucky. I think there's there, there, it's so many of the things that I've gotten to work on before in robotics. I you know, I I've always really enjoyed, uh, but finding something that has a really massive opportunity for positive impact, uh, and 
and is something that we're, we're, that is both that, that is technologically challenging in the space. You know, there's just very few projects like that, and I think you know Zipline has been on this really interesting journey. Uh, and um, on the on to talk a bit about the robotics and autonomy side of this journey, right? We very intentionally chose air spaces and use cases uh, that it would where we could start operating without perception based autonomy. Um, and we I, that was really important to me because I'd seen so many companies in the world of autonomy of some form or another, that they weren't customer obsessed companies, they were technology obsessed companies. And I, and I, I've just never seen a technology obsessed company make a big impact in the world, you kind of have to go the other way around. And so what's so exciting about where we started is we were able to really scale. And you know, now we've done over 40 million uh, miles uh, of real world operations. Uh, and now as we we've always known that perception based autonomy would be required for future use cases and for future some of the airspaces we want to get in and into. Uh, and then in the last few years, we started developing those technologies, getting to leverage this company that is hyper focused on serving customers in really compelling ways. And I really enjoy that because now now that we're really starting to scale up the, the perception based autonomy work we're doing um, for for all kinds of purposes like airspace integration and like precision delivery. Um, uh, we get to do that with all this data and understanding of what really actually matters for the customer. Uh, and that's, there's, there's something very satisfying about doing hard technology work when you have a lot of confidence of exactly what you need to do to make it work for your customer versus having to imagine it and hope that someday maybe you get it right. It's a, uh, it's, it's very easy to build the wrong thing in that world and, and versus the, the kind of being tech customer led. So I, I that gets me really excited. <laughs> I think this is a really, really excellent point, and that leads me to think about something because I think you said something about the company focused about technology, not the customer. I think that's really excellent point. I actually I saw yesterday a video of uh, a woman in China in a hospital. She's kicking the robot. I don't know if you saw this video. It's just going viral, and just it is smashed the robot. It's humanoid, semi-humanoid robot. So it was, it was weird to see a human destroying a robot. Just to out of fr frustration here. And when yeah. I'm looking to certain companies designing robots, actually, we had a couple of episodes about humanoid robots, for example, and the set of market. But it seems from what you said, and the technology, you can change the market. And it seems, this is a question, do you think we're building something released in the robotics? Does it make sense? Like, for example, humanoid robot, yes, some people like arguing, it doesn't make sense to have a humanoid robot. And others say, yes, it makes sense. But there is no market. There is no need, actual need. There is no, you know what I mean? And yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> this is interesting. So, but I, in the in the couple of years I spent from when we took Ross at Willow Garage and created a foundation to where it started Zipline, I spent a lot of time with companies that were starting a, a, a robotics company. And I, my advice to them was was very simple. It was like, they would come to me and say, "Hey, you know, do you want to be a co-founder? We're doing this robotics company." I'd say, "Cool, you know." when you have 10 customers, 10 humans who want what you're building, let's talk about like what we're going to build. And what was interesting is, of course, many people I never heard back from. And, the, and then the few that I did hear back from that went and did that, you know, I would just say of those four, exactly four of them that, that came back to me with customers, and we had these deep conversations, two of them ended up building technology that you would never describe as a robot uh, to solve the customer problem. And two, maybe you'd think of as a robot. And I think what's interesting about this is, is um, there's it's if you there, 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 there's a lot of it's very easy to build things that people don't want right and i think this is and don't really need um and i think there's there's a lot of you know, I, you know i'm very passionate about this in the robotics community i you know every, every, one of my i often get triggered when someone's like oh i'm building a collaborative robot and i i always ask them like why <laughs> you know if you look at the machines that, that that we use today right your dishwasher right i love my dishwasher but i've never ever come home and said to myself, I would like to collaborate with my dishwasher. Never. I would never say that, right? I don't think anybody in the history of the world has thought that way. You want these tools to enable you to be productive. You want them to, you know, just like your laptop, one of the most powerful tools we have uh, from, a, from a, well, in a lot of ways, uh, a more and more robotic technology. And generally, it's the technologies that make up robots. You don't think that way. It's not like I want to collaborate with my with my laptop, you know, that's just not how humans think about tools that make them more productive. And I think when you, that one little shift in mindset of saying, Hey, rather than robots being these things from movies that like, you know, sort of you, you collaborate with to saying, Hey, robots are tools for humans. You, 
it changes everything about how you think about the, the sort of designed and technical trade-offs of what you're going to build and how you're going to build it and how people are going to interface with it. And if you focus on making a tool that people love, uh, then all of a sudden, and it can still be robotic, then all of a sudden it, it, people start to actually want to use it and they see how they can use it and so on. Um, and I think that that, that little switch uh, has made a huge difference in a lot of companies that I've been close to. Uh, and I, you know, as you've probably seen, many robotic startups have come and gone that talk about collaborative robotics. And I think they just, when they get to the real world, there's nobody at the, there's no human who's like, cool, I would like to collaborate with your robot. It's like, that's just not how people think about it. It's more, it's like, how can I use your robot to make myself productive, to make my company productive, to make, you know, solve this problem. And anyway, so it, 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 it enables robots to, um, it enables entire teams to change their ethos and, and really focus on what matters. And I think this is something that, um, well, anyway, I, I, I'm very passionate about this. And I, I always breaks my heart when I see another company trying to make a collaborative, you know, have that mindset towards robotic technology versus, you know, making tools that humans love that, that use te robotic technology. Mm -hmm. Maybe I want to ask you that case. Do you see any, if you can share any robots so far that's interesting to you, you find very, very impressive, if you want, would like to share? Yeah, no, great question. I mean, there's obviously, like I mentioned, my favorite, the dishwasher. <laughs> so I, yeah, one, of my, one of my favorite definitions of a robot is a machine that doesn't work yet. Um, and because once it works, we don't call it a robot anymore, right? Like a dishwasher, we don't call that a robot. But it, once it works, it's like, and, and even, even things like, you know, at the edge, maybe a Roomba, for example, right? Like most people, like they just call it a Roomba or they even name it, right? Uh, and they don't think of it as a robot anymore because they understand what it is and it, they start to describe it as, as, as the thing that it is as opposed to a robot. So, you know, I think there's, there's lots of things like that in the, in the you know, there's, there's lots of great products out there. You know, one of my favorite from, you know, it's, it's still thriving, right? The universal robotics, right? I think they, they, ha they really thought about this in the right way of like, how do you make not just an arm, uh, that is very useful, but uh, a software sort of way of programming a robot arm that is really accessible to lots of people so that they can use it as a tool to make themselves more productive. I think it's a great example of a robot that just has done incredibly well. Um, and it's, it's a great example because at, at that same sort of at time frame that Universal Robotics was coming up, lots of other people were making arms of various sorts that were, you know, they were trying to make them collaborative robots and those companies have come and gone. <laughs> and uh, I think it's a great example of that uh, that real inflection of sort of a robot that really, uh, that really works and I, you know, is useful. Another great example is, you know, uh, smart home speakers, right? Same, by the way, it's a similar journey. At the same time, smart home speakers were starting to become a thing that of course are really useful and, and really nice to have around. Uh, people were trying to make sort of robot versions of that, right? It was like, oh, let's make it drive around or let's put a face on it, all this kind of thing. And it turns out that no one needs those details. It's the, it's just the, it's just the speaker and the microphone is really what, what people want. And I think that's a great example of like, don't try to put robots technology into a problem, really understand what humans would like solved and what is that simple as possible way to solve that problem. I can't agree more with that. Maybe the last question for you, when you think about the future, since you are so passionate, when you look for future of the blind, do you imagine something crazy? I don't know, just your imagination, like what kind of vehicles <laughs> or trend? You know, this kind of thoughts, but, what do you have in your mind yeah. when you look at the future? Yeah, so I have nothing but crazy ideas in my mind. <laughs> but I, you know, I think the, uh, I think the, you know, um, the, there's a few things we're doing at Zipline that, 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 that we don't often talk about that much. And I think the, there's this huge, there's this huge sort of set of projects that we have to tackle behind the scenes. I, I alluded to some of this with things like the airspace architecture, how our aircraft deconflict with one their, one another, uh, how uh, you know very near forecasting of weather to fly around uh, thunderheads, um, uh, how regulators oversee a whole bunch of uh, drones in the airspace. Uh, we, we've been developing all these core technologies to enable us to serve our customers. Uh, but these are also the core technologies that are going to be required for the future of aviation, uh, right? The future of aviation is, 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 is automated, right? And this is a really exciting future if we do it well. And this is something that I'm really excited for Zipline to be a big part of making sure we do in a way that's uh, very scalable and very safe. Um, so as, as these new use cases like drone delivery uh, and eventually things like flying cars and stuff like that all kind of come to fruition, we have, the, we have really learned from experience how to run these massive autonomous scale systems. And um, this is part of the fun of Zipline. I, we don't often talk about it this way, but you know, Zipline is the largest autonomous system in the world. 
Uh, and uh, it's weird to say that out loud. I don't mean just be drone delivery or something like that of like any autonomy operating at scale uh, in terms of uh, all the national scale, the amount of distance we travel, this, the number of uh, sort of agents in the world, in the wild. And um, this is something that's, that's uh, obviously that's a, you get there incrementally and you learn a lot of lessons along the way uh, to, to, to figure out how the future needs to look for autonomous aviation. So I think, think a lot about how that, how that future is going to work. And um, I'm not only excited about the autonomy side of that, but I think the fact that we've demonstrated that it can be quiet, it can be unobtrusive. These are also things that make it exciting, right? Like when we, if we imagine you know, drone delivery that we never notice because it's so quiet, that's great. <laughs> Versus uh, I think a lot of us, at least back in when I started Zipline, I was like, ooh, drone delivery that sounds like quadcopters buzzing around. That doesn't sound very great. And so I was like, okay, can we solve each of these problems to make this be a future we actually want to live in? Um, yeah. Excellent. I don't know if I have any final words for people listening or what community, any final words you like to say? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, th I, I'm well. I'm obviously very excited about Zipline's mission, right? The, to to create this uh, delivery system that serves all humans equally, and you know, we started in the healthcare space, which is where there's incredible need and, and an incredible opportunity, uh, and we're still scaling in the healthcare space around the world uh, in in seven countries today, and and many more to come. Um, all these other use cases too. I, the, the more we dig into these use cases around, well, we mentioned food and all these other things for ma basically making everybody more productive in, in their in their work and in their personal life. Uh, I'm just so excited about that, and I think there's um, it's it's a uh, it's a really exciting time where all these amazing technologies and AI and robotics are all coming together to make this happen. And it's something that it, it's it's not lost on me that we are building on the shoulders of giants of the of the last you know 50 years of robotics and AI development. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, anyway, I'm very grateful for all the work that's done in this, in this space and very excited to see what comes next.